Welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theatre Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. You know when you're hungry and you want something delicious to eat, but you just don't have time for a full meal? Well, we will learn today how our guests have taken care of the musical theater equivalent of that with their bite-sized Broadway mini musical podcast. Let's jump right in to learn more about Bite Size Broadway, Indie Works Theater Company, and a whole lot more with today's guests of Christopher Michaels and Jonathan Lynch. Christopher, Jonathan, welcome. Hi, thank hey, you. Thanks so much. No problem. So before we get into all of that stuff, I always like to get to know my guests a little better and get our listeners to get to know you better. So, uh, Christopher, we're going to start with you. The 30-second bio of Christopher. Oh, geez. Um, okay. So, uh, well, my name is Christopher Michaels, and um, and I'm a New York-based producer and director. Um, I'm also the founder of Indie Works Theatre Company and the executive producer for Bite Sized Broadway. Um, I work mostly on musical theater, and uh, I've been um, producing and directing for for quite a number of years, um, and gotten to know Jonathan in the process uh, by directing some work with him uh, as well. So, yeah, that's that's that. <laughs> and Jonathan, yourself, who is Jonathan in thirty seconds? Uh, Jonathan Lynch is a New York-based composer, producer, songwriter, music director, pianist, uh, multi-hyphenate, a lot of things within musical theater, theater, music, that sort of an area. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, now, um, of course, I live in New York City. I love it here. I love biking through the park. I love... Um, <laughs> Feels like I'm about to sing, I love Betsy or anything like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's um, music and musical theater professional. Nice. Very nice. So before we get in again, um, were you always into musical theater or is that something you discover a little bit later in life, Christopher? Um, when I was like really young, like, you know, three and four, my grandmother used to always watch um Turner Classic Movies, and they used to have a Broadway week uh, on Turner Classic Movies, and um, and I remember she sat me down one day, and we the first musical I ever saw on there was Oklahoma, and um, and then right after that, Kiss Me Kate was the next movie to go up, and I just was so taken uh, by it, and I afterwards, um, I, I don't remember this, my and grandmother tells the story much better, but uh, I, I apparently went up to her and grabbed her face and said. I'm going to do that. And that was kind of it. And, and everything that I have done in my life, um, work-wise, even, even my graphic design work and everything is all, uh, geared towards serving the theater industry. And so, uh, all of my graphic design work is for a film and TV show, uh, sorry, film and, um, theater shows, uh, you know, anytime that I've had a chance to be involved in something just to kind of keep me involved and keep me in the room and keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening in the industry. I've, I've done it. Nice. Jonathan yourself. So, um, my dad was a professional actor back in the day. Uh, and when, uh, when I was born, uh, he was actually in a production of Guys and Dolls at the time in uh, the in the Chicagoland area. Uh, he plays Sky Masterson. There's a sequence at the end of the show where, um, like, uh, Sarah and Adelaide are dreaming about like what they could turn Nathan and Sky into, and uh, Sky comes out with a little baby doll that he's holding, and uh, like that's supposed to be the dream that he's like this parent now. And one night, that was my stage debut at about a month old. My dad brought me out on stage in Guys and Dolls, and I was very well behaved, thankfully. But somebody in the audience did have a picture ready of it, so I've got that little like framed thing back in my childhood bedroom back oh, in awesome. uh, back in the Chicago land area. Um, so yeah, from there for a long time, I didn't know if I wanted to go into science or theater, because uh, yeah, my dad, professional actor, I loved, uh, I loved going out to like all the things that he was involved in and seeing the shows and hanging out with everybody backstage. Um, but my mom is a scientist. She is a uh, like psychology professor. She's the head of a neuroscience and psychology department at a college out there. Uh, so I loved that stuff too. And ultimately I decided, okay, theater is what it's going to be uh, when I was at Northwestern and I had to pick which sort of track I wanted to be on. And I looked at the prerequisites for science versus theater and science. It was like organic chemistry and, you know, like uh, all of these very basic, but very complicated weed out kinds of courses that like you say, yeah, if you're lucky if you get a C in the course. Uh, or like analysis and performance of non-dramatic literature. And I'm like, I like that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> so um, 
it probably wasn't that alone. I was probably already headed in that direction, but that's sort of how I got involved in musical theater. Neuropsychology and theater are not that far apart from each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are not. <laughs> uh, my parents right. like to joke that um, my mom likes to work on the nuts my dad works with. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> Perfect symbiotic relationship there. <laughs> Christopher, was there any other uh, profession you were thinking about going into? When you were in high um, school going, oh, I wish I'd maybe done this. No, no, actually, from from that time, I mean, I, uh, you know, like I said, I was very young, um, at, you know, probably about three or four. And, and um, from that point on, I mean, I just. I just wanted more and more and more. And so my grandmother would take me to the library and you could um, you could check out vhs tapes do you does anybody know what those are anymore um you can check out the vhs tapes right and and so like we got um we got vhs's of like uh carousel and guys and dolls and um just all of these all of these movie musicals that were available at the time um and for the next you know few years that was kind of it and then uh my mom started putting me in in some music classes that were like at the children's theater down the way because that's kind of all we could afford and um and then i went to performing arts schools from the time i was in middle school through high school i didn't go to college believe it or not um and uh and i mean even when i couldn't even when i wasn't getting the acting work um i called it pulling a tootsie i i uh did drag for 10 years um and it was my way of still performing and still being involved in in some sort of performance um aspect without uh, you know, when I was too young or too fat or too thin or too old or too whatever I was at the time um, for the shows I was auditioning for. Uh, so so there was never anything else. And even though I've done a lot of other things, um, uh, it's just always been in service of being able to be still involved in theater. Well, you started a theater company. So let's I let's did. talk about Indie Works Theater Company. How did that come about? <laughs> Um, yeah, so so Indie Works Theater Company, uh, we we produce um, new and uh, like high quality new and rediscovered works of theater. That's what we'll call them. Um, these are the pieces that you know. I have so many really amazingly talented friends who are not well known, and it's not because their work isn't good. It's because maybe their work isn't commercial. Uh, enough for Broadway or off Broadway, maybe, um, maybe the pieces just aren't getting to the right people because their names aren't big enough or whatever. And I realized that these were the kind of stories that I wanted to tell as a director. And and um, so I said, you know what, I I am at this moment in time, fortunate enough to put some resources um, into making these things happen. And so uh, I started working with uh, a good friend, Kit Goldstein Grant, who Jonathan and I have worked with numerous times um, and produced a, a, a short musical that she had written um, with some other friends of ours, other collaborators of Jonathan's and, and mine um, called The Commuters. And uh, so we did that. And then we did um, a show off Broadway at Theater Row uh, back in 2019 called The Giant Hoax. Um, which was which was really fantastic, and and then shortly after, bite sized Broadway. But it was all um, it was all to kind of do the kind of work that I wasn't seeing that I wanted to see, and doing the kind of work that my friends were putting forward that nobody was really um, paying enough attention to for for whatever reason that is. Yeah. That's that's literally one of the hardest things as a writer, right? To find someone or, or venue or somebody who's going to invest in that new work or believe in it and back it. And so what you well, I think there's awesome. a lot of writers who, um, you know, the, it, it's really about knowing where where your work fits, right? Not every show is a Broadway show, and that's fine. Broadway uh, is not the end all be all. There is amazing theater that's happening all over the world and all over you know the united states and in some of the smallest houses there's actually a company down in uh, miami called micro theater um, i don't know if they're still around but they literally do one person shows for an audience of one and um it's it's amazing uh and and the work is really phenomenal so um it was kind of this this challenge that you know i i don't need to 
I don't need to be a big Broadway director to tell the kind of stories that interest me and I think will interest other people. And so, yeah, so that's kind of how it all came about. I'm glad you said that. That's that's it's still the permeating thought is Broadway or West End is the be all and end all. And it's just not. And I'm glad people like yourselves are are trying to smash that that concept because I've always said it as well, because I talk with so many writers and they're like, oh, I want to be on Broadway. I went, your show is not meant for Broadway. Well, right. there are plenty of shows that that have gone to Broadway that that weren't meant for Broadway. I mean, mm-hmm. and and I'll probably I, I, maybe I shouldn't say it, but um, but getting the band back together, right? Getting the band back together it, to me was a festival show or maybe an off Broadway show. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we uh, a good friend of mine uh, put a lot of put put some money into it, um, and we went and saw it, and it was just like it was fun. It was a great time. We had a wonderful time, but. It just wasn't meant for Broadway. Um, the, Be More Chill is another one. Be More Chill, I saw it in New Jersey. It was fantastic. I saw it off Broadway. It was um, it was great. And and that's kind of where I feel like it should have lived. But once it got to Broadway, I think it was just too big um, for, for what the show was. And, and I think that it's unfortunate that people put the shows in places that maybe they don't belong because they feel like they need... Um, they need that Broadway clout to get it to go anywhere else for any number of reasons, both the cachet of it and the um, like the sheer reach of what a Broadway show can do for you. And yeah, the economics and the money of it. Like if those kinds of resources were put to many other kinds of places, if they were put to more off Broadway venues or regional places or like the tiny micro theaters of this world, I think that perhaps we would see a cultural change eventually. So it's really a kind of like, it's a sort of negative feedback loop I feel with um, with um, the the predominance of Broadway at the expense of other places. This is somebody who loves Broadway, by the way. I freaking love it. So like, <laughs> and nobody's saying that the shows that we've mentioned either uh, aren't vi- you know aren't viable or aren't good or anything like that. I mean, I love the shows, but you know, it, it's just um, I think we just have this vision that if it doesn't get to Broadway, it can't be a success, and uh, and we are very much challenging that idea with with what we're doing right now absolutely that's that's fantastic so jonathan how did when did you get involved with the the theater company was that right at the beginning or did you come in uh, after oh um (laughs) i know i was involved pretty early on uh i christopher we met at uh across a crowded room right yeah uh yeah actually the the year that we did the commuters um as the reading yeah uh you were premiering uh, one of your 20 minute musicals um yes and yeah and it was actually right after your daughter was born because that's how we started started talking um we were both rushing out seven years ago (laughs) yeah 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 um yeah so um Every summer, the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts puts on this thing that I affectionately like to call a summer camp for musical theater writers. (laughs) It's called Across a Crowded Room. Uh, They take, um, it's a public program, so anybody can come in and sign up for it if you're in the New York area. And you, the goal is to write a 20-minute musical um, by basically the end of the summer. So the first session of it, you pair up, you work with people you've never worked with before or whose work you've admired for a while, but you've never actually gotten the chance to like have that one-on-one kind of time with or people who are just brand new and enthusiastic and you like the cut of their jib or whatever it is. Uh, so then after that, there are three sessions that happen throughout the summer where they pair up the musical theater writers who are in the program with industry professionals who will come in and help with book and with music and with lyrics, um, one on each day. And we're talking some like really amazing people like Janita Sori was there and Michael John LaCusa. Lynn and, Aarons, um, Jason yeah, Robert Brown. Yeah, just some like top of the top people who are giving you this you know, fantastic advice about your work in progress. Uh, then at the end of the summer, there's a presentation of all the 20 minute shows and it's fantastic seeing, uh, first of all, who crosses the finish line? Because the main thing is like, can you finish something? And if the answer is yes, then it's like, fantastic let's do this um and even though that's sort of where um where christopher and i met i think that that was also part of the inspiration for the bite-sized broadway podcast for me too because i i've seen all of these phenomenal works that are these 20 minute long musicals 
And I've been a part of other kinds of programs too that want you to like finish up by writing a short musical, like in the BMI Layman Angle workshop, um, very prestigious workshop here in New York. Uh, you end your first year with writing a 10 minute musical. And I know that there are half a dozen other places where writers finish up by writing these short shows. Um, and I love these things. I love these short musicals because they are incredibly talented people who are just feeling free to be wild and experimental with their work, but applying the good craft that they are learning and developing or that they've been working on for years for these short things. And there's always been a thing in my mind where I'm like, well, like, in literature, there are novels and there are short stories. So why can't we have that in musical theater? Why is it always the full evening of a musical that is the sort of predominant thing that we're talking about? Like, why can't we have these short works that are as prestigious as short stories can be, but are are just a different sort of a thing that you might be interested in? So um, that, was, that was the idea. Um, I had just finished working on The Giant Hoax with Indie Works. And I went up to Christopher and I said, hey, look, I've got this idea about a thing. I've been like batting it around for a little while now. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe you can help me with it. Maybe we can figure something out about it. Maybe like uh, maybe you can just help me form it, some advice about it. And um, so we started talking and suddenly we were going and this was going to be it. Well, and, uh, and so I have to. Um... to oh, yeah. I just just to to kind of fill in something real quick. So um so Jonathan uh, had also been our music director for our summer cabaret series that we did um that year, which was kind of a fundraise uh, a fundraising. But we we did four different cabarets, and each of them were to kind of build up some money for the giant hoax. So that was one thing. And then Jonathan and I um both worked on the giant hoax, which I produced and directed, and he music directed and did the um did the arrangements for, which were really really wonderful. And um. And then after that, so so my producing partner, Jeremy, um, <laughs> Jeremy and I had been working on on stuff together since 2015. And uh, he had said to me right after Giant Hoax had had opened, he's like, listen, I think I have to take a step back. I think I need to, you know, just there's this was a lot. The, the show uh, Giant Hoax was just a lot. And um he said, I think the next project I do just has to be really simple. And so when Jonathan came to me with this idea, um, I, I remembered that Jeremy had also said at one point that he he really was getting into podcasts and, and getting into podcasting. So I just went to him and I said, hey, Jonathan has this idea. It's, it, uh, you know, it's just kind of a simple, like, learn a musical, sing through a musical, talk about the musical, that's it. And um, and he's like, you know what? That sounds like a really simple project. Sure, let's Let's do it. And uh, and then so the three of us met up at, at the New York Public Library, actually, to um, to kind of discuss what this what this thing was going to be this really simple podcast. And um, it was all supposed to take place where you could kind of do everything in a day. Right. You could record the whole thing, um, uh, rehearse, record and do the talk back all in all in like, you know, th four hours. Right. And that was kind of it. And then the day that we signed the contracts, um, literally that day, it was March 10th uh 2020 and it was the day that he they announced <laughs> the city was gonna shut down by the end of the week um and we were just like well now what do we do <laughs> you know how do how do we yeah. what do we do now and um luckily uh jonathan works with um uh andrew fox who is a who's a fellow teacher at amda um in new york and uh he he said, you know, my friend, my friend, Andrew, um, might be able to help us kind of create something during the pandemic. And so after, you know, weeks of realizing, wow, this isn't going to let up anytime soon, we decided to kind of forge forward. And, um, you know, it was just the four of us. I mean, it was just Jeremy, myself, Jonathan and, and Andrew kind of all coming up with ideas, trying to make this thing work. Because all all that you had at the time was Zoom musicals, right, or or Zoom plays and musicals, um, and streaming stuff. But like, okay, so you're getting the big, the big recordings of of Hamilton and all these other things. But what you're not getting is this new work. And what you are getting of the new work on Zoom was technically um, 
uh, technically inferior, I'll say, you know, because of the lag time and because of all these things. And it just left we're all everyone still figuring out how to make all these things work. Like, yeah. this was just like, let's like, since we're stuck here at home, how do we try to figure out how to do what we do instead of like, oh, like, this is what I've done for ages. I'm just going to say the story and do the thing. So a and, very different world that we were all in, of course. And I think that, that what we really hit on, um, we, we were talking in a meeting one day, I believe, and, and somebody, I, I don't remember who it was, just said, we want to create the whole Broadway experience right inside your phone. And that's what we strive to do. I mean, even on our on our episodes, it starts with the stage manager saying like, you know, you're, you're hearing the orchestra tune up and you're hearing the, the stage manager call places and and everything. And then he gives the standby and he says, go. And the orchestra starts and everything goes. You hear him say main curtain, go, you, you know, all of these different things, which are really wonderful. And even in um, we call the, the first part of the, the episode act one and the second part of the episode act two, even in the middle, we have a um, our Patreon ad is designed to sound like you're sitting in the theater with other people walking around and talking and somebody's just you know, reaching across the aisle to say like, hey, you know, if you want more content like this, go to go to our Patreon. So we really kind of hit on something special and gave people what they were wanting, which was uh, which was just more and, and more of what exactly? We don't know, but they just wanted more than what they were getting at the time. We were fortunately able to provide that and not only provide it, period, but provide it for free, um, which I mean, not free for us, <laughs> but, you know, but but certainly free for the audience members who wanted to hear it. Well, that's fantastic that you were able to take, you know, what you did during that terrible time. You know, I've heard so many stories of people um, taking that time and building something out of it. Because what else were we going to do during that pandemic? And uh, congratulations on being able to forge forth and create Thank that. You. That's awesome. Um, how did you find the shows for the first season? Uh, a little bit here, a little bit there. <laughs> so, 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 as Jonathan was saying, there, there are, um, there are numerous programs around the world that have these, uh, that have these short musicals as part of their curriculum, right? Um, and you know, like he said, there's BMI. There's also um, BML, which is like the the uh, West End equivalent of of BMI. Um, you know, there's uh, you guys have a program up in up in Canada. Um, that Aaron Jensen was a part of, and they also had to write like a 20 minute musical mm. or something like that. And so, so there's, um, there's just a lot of that. And then because there are people who do these sorts of programs over and over, they've amassed a collection, but what do you do with them? Right? Like you, you can't produce them. And even in, if even if you wanted to put it into a festival, it will cost you, let's see, the commuters was only five characters and, uh, and, we had like a very minimal set and in a festival, it cost us $6,000 to produce. Right. So like, what are you going to do with it? And um, so it collects dust on your shelf in a trunk or, or like, you know, deep on your hard drive. So Jonathan kind of started reaching out to people and saying like, Hey, you know, do you have anything? And then we realized, you know what, we can go beyond just our friends. Right. We can, we can look for things that, um, that might fit the program. And so we did some YouTube searches and stuff. And then, we decided, well, let's just do a submission process and see what we get. And we ended up getting 90 submissions. Um, I mean, overall, because after after submissions closed, we realized um, there were a lot of, you know, it was a lot of white uh, cis men who were our, made up the, the writer's pool, right? So we wanted to target um, our efforts more towards um, writers of color, um, writers who may have disabilities, also uh, female and trans non-binary, gender non-conforming um, people. And so after all was said and done, we had 90 submissions from 120 writers um, from all over the world. Uh, and we ended up with nine musicals by 18 writers from six different countries. And it was really, um, it was really, I mean, it was really awesome. I, we were so blessed with people who who just wanted to kind of be part of something. Jonathan, I'd love to hear about a few of them that uh, did make it to season one. Well, let's see. Um, uh, we opened with one called The Getaway. Um, the Getaway, it's a um, sort of a, a crime story. It's very funny. The music is really jazzy and cool. Um, it's... Um, 
uh, like it, it takes place in a, a sort of Uber and they have people who um, are using the Uber as a getaway vehicle from a bank that they just robbed. <laughs> um, and it's touching and heartfelt and funny, and uh, it just it, it it came off so so cool that I'm like, okay, like we we need to. This is going to be a, a heck of a way to open this new podcast. So let's uh, uh, let's lead off with this one. Um, everybody involved was so great on that one. I think by that point we'd really sort of hit our stride in terms of like our workflow and in terms of everything like that. So it was a a, a, a very nice experience to be working on as well. Um, and if I can was... actually say really quick there, um, yeah, yeah. with, with that musical, what was great about opening with that show is the very first voice that you hear for our entire podcast on our very first episode was Andy Roninson, who, um, who had a podcast years before ours called take a 10 musicals. And those were 10 minute musicals, but he wrote all of them and he recorded all of them. And, um, and there was no talk back afterwards, but they were, it, it's kind of like, his program paved the way for us to kind of do ours. And, um, and so it was kind of a nice little, you know, to the, <laughs> to the people who, who knew, uh, who knew Andy. Yeah. Sorry, we love Andy's work very much. So it was great that we were able to sort of like rope him in to some extent on our project too, that, you know, yeah. that we would see his as sort of a parent to ours or like a sort mm -hmm. of uh, that sort of thing with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, other works. Um, oh, I got to plug mine, I suppose. Um, <laughs> uh, I was the composer of one called Ransom Ware, uh, and it is, uh, it's is—it's the last one that we did in the season. So I guess I'm talking about the first and the last show today. Um, and it's, It was the first one um, we recorded, though. Which, um, it was the first one we recorded. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. We were comfortable with that one first because um, because I was the one involved in it. And so I figured, OK, like, you know, if you need to consult with a writer, like just, you know, I'll unmute myself. And I'll let you know what I think. <laughs> so we knew that it'd be a lot easier to like since we were still trying to figure out how to do everything, you know, like our workflow, all that fun stuff. Uh, we figured that it'd be easier working on one where like the person was like right there as a part of the process, too. Um, so um yeah this show it's um there's a ransomware program that infects grandma's computer and threatens to delete all of her photos and so her son comes up and uh, tries to help her um like defeat the computer virus and uh, in the end it's about um going outside touching grass and getting offline for a little bit and making some <laughs> memories so um yeah. Uh, oh, that one was such a blast to work on, too. Like that was like the sheer adrenaline of we're doing this. Let's go. Come on. That sort of carried us through a lot of the technical difficulties that we were working through. And Isn't there were the one plenty of technical difficulties. It wasn't a hurricane, but it was something like a hurricane. That oh, came yeah. Through and, like, knocked um, up people's power in the middle of it. No, it, it there was a there was a really bad storm. Um, yeah. and, and in Jersey. Uh, so Mike Pre Jr., who um, who played Thomas, the grandson, and then also he wrote our theme song and stuff like that. He we were recording and like we had all these technical difficulties, and right when we started to hit our stride, his power went out, and um, and he called me and he said, "I I don't know when it's going to turn back on." <laughs> Yeah, so we were like, we're living in the middle of a plague and a hurricane. What the hell is happening here? <laughs> but we were fortunate uh, enough to have. Uh, people like like Mike and um, Sierra Ryan, who was also a uh, part of our cast, and then um, Jay Lane Marcos, who who and and Cassidy Layton, who were both um, stuck in their closets with like blankets over their heads and like you know trying to trying to make this thing happen and really working with us. Um, and and they were just so patient and so kind and so generous with their with their time and talent um, to to help us make this thing you know go and it it really shows in the final product too yeah that was something that we saw like throughout the process we were just how kind and generous and um, enthusiastic about this and and just like people genuinely wanting to help us make it all work out people who were putting blankets over their heads and recording <laughs> it uh and like i just the gratitude i feel for everybody involved in the first season was just immense so um if you're listening out there thank you everybody uh, it was great uh and and thank you for being you i guess <laughs> also because of the pandemic um we were able to to uh get some some really amazing people who not only wanted to to work you know on this project but they just wanted to work right that you know they they 
they weren't and and we unfortunately didn't have the money to pay you know a kajillion dollars but we paid what we could and made sure that everybody got a fair um a fair price for for what we were doing but we were able to get people like Anne Harada and Tom Sesma um Constantine Morolis and um I, I never know if I'm saying his name right I've heard it said like 95 different ways and Karen Mason <laughs> Michael Kostroff like Telly Leung just this this amazing um casting pool Kennedy Kamigawa yeah, Kennedy Kanagawa, the breakout star of Into the Woods, uh, Milky yeah, White, yeah. right? I mean, it just really, um, all of the people involved were were so fantastically um, giving, you know? I mean, and they, they understood when we had problems, and I think uh, uh, it was... It was really gratifying that after everything was over, even with all the technical difficulties and even with, you know, people in closets and and having to turn off air conditioners and fans and things in the summer so that we could get good audio for them to email us or see us um, when we could finally be in person again and say, I really love that. Let me know when you're doing season two is a really big, you know, I mean, my heart just kind of swells. And so um, <laughs> so I'm really grateful to those people. It's a truly wonderful community we're all a part of. Very nice. Speaking of season two, <laughs> good segue. Yeah. Whoa, what's happening with that? Uh, yeah. So, so submissions um, are open for for season two, uh, where we are accepting um, these short form, ten to twenty five minute musicals, um, and we expanded it to twenty five only because there are some people who have these these one acts that they've written that didn't weren't specifically for like a twenty minute program, but. Um, you know, we can probably work with those and, and kind of get them to the right um, time. But we are looking for um, for writers from all over the world who want to submit their work. If you're in Canada, if you're in the UK, Australia, um, last season we had we had a writer from Manila and then another one from um, Israel. And so if you're in, you know, any of these markets and you've got a musical, send it our way and, and um, we will have our reading committee take a look and... Uh, we're, we're doing nine more this season um, and we're also doubling our episodes by splitting up the musical. So the musical is its own episode. And then two weeks later, we'll have the talk back episode, which kind of gives people a little bit more to listen to. We can really have more fun um, with the talk backs. One of the things that Jonathan wanted when, when we started this whole thing was that you don't just get to hear the musical, you get to know the writer and, um, and that's, I remember when that's... I was like little and I was in the Chicago area and I was like hearing about new musicals or, or like whenever anything sort of filtered their way out to me and I would be like desperate to find out more about it. One of the first places I would always, always look is who wrote it? What else did this person do? Now that I've discovered this show, can I discover these other half a dozen shows that this person did? And I want to give that experience to people who are listening to this podcast as well. Like, oh, like where are you listening to this show? So like, and this is such a cool, weird, awesome, beautiful little thing. Uh, let me find everything else that this writer's ever done. Let me listen <laughs> to what the writer says and and uh, hear their perspective on musical theater and life and the craft and everything else that they've ever done. Like I, I want to be able to give that to some other little kid who's like listening in the Chicago suburbs or wherever else he might be. Well, and it's really important too because because these don't people these people don't have a name yet, right? Um, it it's it's important. For for us to recognize that, oh, this isn't just a frivolous, you know, one-off thing that they've done. Most of these people have a body of, I mean, Kit Goldstein Grant, who we've worked with number numerous times, has tens upon tens of full-length musicals that she's written over the past, you know, 15, 20 years. And, and they're fantastic pieces of work. But unless you know Kit and know, you know, or have been involved with some of her work, you... um. You don't know that she has all that, right? And so we kind of want to be able to give a platform where you hear the work, you hear how the work came to be, and then you hear about what that writer has uh, going on beyond that. Um, and so we've we've kind of split up the episode so we can take a little bit longer uh, with those talkbacks because um, we were cutting down like hour long conversations. Too. We'll uh, we'll we'll get back to that later, but or, you know, some other time. But yeah, we'll we'll do some fun things with those other episodes too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I love the, what you guys are doing because it, it, it kind of mirrors what I want to do in my, in my thought process of there is more to musical theater than just, you know, 
the English speaking world of Canada, the U S and the UK and Australia. Right. I've interviewed people in Finland and Mexico and Korea and, and things like that because musical theater is global and there's great works all over the world. And so much of it gets mothballed or like you said, gets stuck on the hard drive and nobody hears it. And it's so unfortunate. And you guys are giving opportunity for these people to be discovered. And that's a fantastic thing that you guys are doing. Well, and they're giving us, you know, the the uh, ability to kind of um, direct and to music direct and to orchestrate and to stretch those muscles as well. You know, people think that it's <clears throat> that the, that the musical creation is just about the writers, but it's not. There is a whole team of people um, that makes it work. And and in our case, uh, where it's something that's um, broadcast and not on stage. I mean, we had a very small team of of people who were all wearing ninety five billion different hats right um but we also had people like jay rosen who was behind the scenes mixing and mastering all of our episodes who did fantastic work um andrew fox who was uh, a producer and, and orchestrator i mean he just the way he thought about every show and the way to use the instruments to tell the story uh, we have a show called sheila the tiny turtle with um or by uh caitlin burt and amir schoenfeld and when Andrew listened to it, he said, well, I kind of hear this with Australian um, Australian folk instruments, but I don't think that we should, since the show is, is about a, a turtle who goes on a journey, he said, I don't think we should use any music, uh, uh, musical instruments that you can't carry with you. And, um, and it was just really, really well thought out, which was, which was wonderful. Um, yeah, we, well, had, we had uh, a long discussion of like what exactly kind of folk music, Australian folk music is versus say the American folk music that we're a little bit more aware of versus like British folk music, which sort of like lent itself out and influenced some of these other cultures so much. And the other sort of things going into it, like that just sort of thought of like the detail that went into that, but just, I, I love sitting around being like, yeah, I dig this, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was educational for all of us too, right? We, you know, learning um, that, that, you know, learning about the instruments that make up Australian folk music and learning that, you know, the didgeridoo is very specific to a certain region. And if we're not in that region, we shouldn't use that instrument, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and that goes for, for kind of every show we used, um, we used like the melodica. Of Bastiano di Bologna was another big one like that too. It was all instruments that would have been around from medieval Europe, but used in a way that they never would have used them. Uh, yeah. Like as a real sort of like musical theater eyes, like um, uh, uh, all of these, all of these really, really old kinds of instruments. And it was a delight. And I loved how that one sounded and came out too. That one was, um, was written by uh Canadian uh, Aaron Jensen. Um, and it's just a bizarre show, but it really is. I loved it so and much. It was it's so really, funny. <laughs> and that's and that's the other cool thing too that like you know people it, when when you're thinking about submissions and whatnot, we we want things sure that have that have audience appeal, right? But it's not just about um, you know we're not looking for just the quote unquote Broadway sound, right? Like musical theater has become so many things over the years. Um, you know, with with shows like, uh, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar, and then you have Rent, and then you have um, uh, Hamilton, and all these things that are really pushing the, and then Freestyle Love Supreme, and, and all these things that are pushing the boundaries of what musical storytelling is. Um, and so I, I don't want people to think that we're not going to take their work seriously if it's a bit out of the box. Um, we've also actually been this... presented in a way that's a little bit unusual. Like if this, if there's not a traditionally notated musical theater score, like, well, we'll figure it out. It's fine. Mm -hmm. If we like the, if we like, I don't know, to get a little bit poetic, I guess, if we like the soul of the piece, if we like the, the, the main core of it, like we'll figure out how to do this. Sometimes it's you really... don't know what you like until you hear it. Right. It's yeah, very true. Too. Absolutely. Well, it was funny. Um, there, there was, uh, I mean, there were a few musicals that, that came across our desks last season that um, all of us were like, you know, somebody would say like, oh, I don't I don't really think this one will fit. And and, you know, somebody would somebody else would would champion it. 
And by the end of the the season, like those were the ones that we really loved the most. It's it's just kind of that thinking out of the box storytelling. The other thing I just want to mention too is that this season where um we are implementing a group of writers, um, uh, sorry, readers, excuse me, uh, implementing a group of readers. And um, these readers are are paid and they're trusted and they are people who um, are of all different, you know, backgrounds and races and gender identities and, um, and ages and all that kind of stuff. So we wanted to make sure that um, people who are submitting this year aren't afraid of who's who's taking a look at their work. Um, there are multiple different passes that people do on on each musical and kind of evaluate them. So we get a really good idea of um, of what the musical is. And uh, I'm hoping that our season will be just as diverse as our group of readers. That's great. Congratulations on that. So let's let's get to the important part of the who, what, where, why, and how. So when do submissions open? When do they close? How can people get a hold of you? Social media, all that fun stuff. Yeah, uh, submissions are open um, uh, February sixth through uh, February. Uh, excuse me, through March fifth. Let me just try that again. February sixth <laughs> through March fifth, twenty twenty three. Um, and during that four week period, uh, you know, once we start building up some of the stuff, we have the readers go in and, and read things, and then hopefully our season will be chosen by March. Uh, excuse me, April seventh. Man, I've got just months and numbers spinning <laughs> through dates. my head. Um, and, and kind of the process is that that people will submit their work, the readers will do a first pass, they get together and vote on which ones get promoted to the next level. Then then other readers in that group will will read the promoted musicals. And then they will make uh, 12 recommendations to the producers, Jonathan, myself, um, uh, Judy, and so on and so forth. And um, from there, we will pick the nine final shows uh, to do for the season. So, yeah, it's it's great. And then and then it's a whirlwind of pre-production and, and uh, you know, production, casting, post-production, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's like a year long uh, thing. So how do they find out about it? What's the website? Uh, you can go to www.indieworkstheater.com dot com that's theater with re um and then uh from there you just click on the bite-sized broadway tab and there are um four pages you can see the cast and crew from the first season you can see the the first season shows and listen to them and then you can also uh submit your musical and find out more information about the um about the reading committee as well we we are really working towards transparency um to make sure that everybody feels like they are seen heard and valued and so uh we will have a list of our readers so you'll know who's who's taking a look at your work although our readers are not allowed to tell you whether or not they read your work but um but you know they can see who's there um we have all of the guidelines set forth um all of the uh you know the the certain way that we ask that you um submit the folder with your materials um, it gives you some uh, frequently asked questions. It gives you a sample of the evaluation form, so you know what we're looking at. Um, everything, which is which is really fantastic. That's great. And for the people who aren't writers but just want to listen to this, will this be coming out summer, winter, fall? What approximately when? Give or uh, fall as of right now, uh, early fall, late summer, early fall, twenty twenty three. Yeah, and then we do we do four shows, and then take a break for um for the holiday and and January, and let everybody just come back, start losing that weight, <laughs> and get through their January uh what is it dry January is that what it was? Get through that, that, and then start back up again in in February. So very cool. Well, again, congratulations on the theater company, uh, the podcast as well, and thank you for what you do for for new writers and new works that might never have been heard. So congratulations on uh, to the both of you on what you've done. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So we were just speaking with uh, Christopher Michaels and Jonathan Lynch, the uh, creators of um, or one of the creators or some of the creators of bite sized Broadway, <laughs> uh, the mini musical podcast uh, tune in next week as we'll speak with another guest or guests about their life, love and passion. That is musical theater. I am your host as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you. <laughs>